Good morning to all of you. Thank you for taking your time off. This presentation for the next 45 minutes is going to be in the area of real world simulation using Simulia Abacus. From all of us at EGS India, we thank you for providing us with the opportunity to introduce ourselves. We have been working in India since 1993 as design engineering consultants and have been associated with Gusso System SolidWorks Corporation since uh, 2000, 1999, 2000. Our association with Gusso Systems uh, Simulia in terms of providing training to the end customers has been there for the last 25 years. Recently, Dassault Systems requested us to represent their products in India, and we are glad to be associated with them. And this is a part of the technology series in terms of sharing our knowledge with our customers and um, helping our customers to develop new products and technologies. One of the things that is very important when it comes to uh, dealing with a finite element analysis, uh, we at EGS have been working in finite element analysis for the last 32 years, is that it is primarily supposed to provide answers or solutions to problems a priori. A priori means in the beginning itself in advance. In other words, unless we look at the system in totality, keeping in mind that the parts that we are simulating as a, are a part of the system, and we are able to capture all the failure modes that we wish the product to be protected against during the service life anticipated, the durability and the quality comes into question. So the two eyes of a product are quality and reliability, right? Quality is as defined by Professor Genichi Taguchi, the financial loss to society after the article has been shipped. Reliability is the probability that the part would meet the service requirements during the, would meet the performance requirements during the service life expected. Now, these two are the eyes of a product. So if the quality or the reliability or both suffers, the product could end up with an untimely demise, which the design engineers or the company does not want. So in terms of that, the spell checking of design is primarily done using simulation. And in that simulation, in addition to multi-domain simulation using other technologies such as bond graphs, finite elements has matured to being a main state in technologies for simulation of real world problems. You take an actuator, a pressure relief valve or an actuator. We know the failure modes that are going to be faced by these products, primarily from our design failure modes and effects analysis document. So in other words, the criticality of those failure modes are determined by the risk priority number that comes in your DFMEA. How does the risk priority number come about or the mitigation of that come about? Primarily from a validation point of view. How is that validation done? Using simulation. Now the word real world simulation as we emphasize here is very important primarily because the accuracy of the analysis results affects the product's performance in real world, in real time. So the closer to the real world simulation we come in, the more accurate our predictions are upfront. A lot of times we have seen people performing finite element analysis. At EGS also we perform finite element analysis extensively for a lot of customers who ask us to um, address their failure issues that their products have been subjected to or the warranty issues that they are coming up with. In all those cases, we perform a finite element analysis, come back and look at and say, oh, these are the red spots, these are the areas where you have trouble, where you, are, you may have issues, and these are probably the results of reasons for which 
the failures are occurring. So in other words, an engineer comes up with a theory or a hypothesis or a predictive engineering model. It could be a manual calculation. It could be a finite element calculation. It could be a combination. And then predicts and says, I have taken care of these. But are all the failure modes accommodated for in the FMEA? Probably not. Which comes to the next point. If all those simulations need to be done, taking varied factors into consideration, then the digital testing of the product becomes important. Historically, finite element analysis, software products and technologies have been developed with two different frames of mind. One is you start in the linear domain and then you add a few capabilities in the nonlinear domain because pretty much most of the problems can be simulated in the linear domain. Or you start with the paradigm that everything is nonlinear and you can switch, give switches which you can turn on and off to turn it into a linear problem. In other words, if the natural phenomena is going to be a nonlinear phenomena, and we need to have all the tools and technologies available with us with providing designer the choice of either performing a linearized analysis or performing a completely nonlinear simulation, that's where softwares such as Simulia Abacus comes into existence. Personally, my association with Abacus goes back to the year 1990 when I started using it for development of new products and technologies while working at Ford Motor Company in the US. I was associated with HKS, which was the organization which developed Abacus by three pioneers, Dr. Hibbert, Dr. Carlson, and Dr. Sorensen, Paul Sorensen. And we were instrumental in the development of a fluid structure element and putting that element to use in the development of a new product. Since the product is already available in the market, I can talk about it. So our association with HKS went back to 1990, 32 years ago. And we have been using Simulia quite a bit, helping customers to develop better products and technologies worldwide. Now, the intent of this presentation is to look at why a nonlinear finite element analysis and what are the different types of nonlinear finite elements analysis available, a small window view of that the real world applications as reported and the benefits of the simulation using these kinds of tools and technologies. And then we will summarize with what are the forward paths. Now, essentially, as I told you earlier, every natural phenomena is inherently nonlinear. In other words, you give a certain load, you get a certain response. You give some other load, you get a different response. When we look at it and we expect the response to be linear, but the measured data is not linear, then we start investigating into the facts behind it. We learn. When we learn from the natural process, we develop technologies. It's a simple mantra. For example, in one of our customers' case, we were looking at a particular deflection on a particular part. In that deflection, if we were to plot the deflection versus the load on a graph, load on the x-axis, deflection on the y-axis, then we expect as long as the load is within the limit load for that particular design, we can look at the graph and say for steel, let us say the part is steel, you can plot the graph and you would expect it to be linear, right? 
because it's within the proportional limits. We are looking at the linear elastic modulus. However, in that particular case, after a certain point in time, the results started becoming nonlinear, even within the linearity of the proportionality constant, which is Young's modulus, right? When we started investigating into that, we found three different insights that we would have otherwise missed. One is, as the deflection was taking place, the stiffness was changing because of geometry. Second is, the assembly was comprising of gap and contact, and there was settling of the component geometries in assembly during the loading phase. And third one was the load and the structure relationship was no longer constant. In other words, the loading was following the deflection, remaining normal to the deflection, not normal to the power geometry when you started with. If we had not looked at these three things, we would have assumed that the displacements what we got in finite elements was admissible and we would have signed off on the product. So the deeper understanding of how things work come as a result of our understanding of the system itself. I will give you another example. We were working with a customer which was in the area of high speed bearing test rig. In other words, a high speed bearing has to be tested on a test rig. So you mount it on a shaft and you allow it to rotate at 70,000 RPM, 110,000 RPM like that. And then you start testing it, loading it. For loading it, for testing it, the shaft needs to be on two bearings, right? Which are again high speed bearings. So in other words, when we were looking at this particular design, we cannot afford to have bearings to be used up for testing a bearing. In other words, the mounted bearings themselves become the testing specimen. So we, we were just looking at a spinning disc at 70,000 RPM. When we looked at that disc, and we all know from your theory of elasticity, from your common knowledge, that the hoop stress will be significant when the component rotates because of the centrifugal force. When the component radially disc stretches, it expands, you get the hoop stress, and then that's the tangential stress, right? So you expect the maximum stress to be coming from the edge of the part. But when you take the component and you simulate it, you see that the stress happens to be at the center of the disc and not at the outer periphery. Then you start saying, what is the problem? Did I make a mistake in my finite element analysis? Probably not. Then where is the problem? Our understanding of the natural phenomena, that's where our problem arises. When you look at that spinning disc and you start increasing the RPM, as the material gets displaced to the outer rim, the material actually comes from the center of the disc. When the material comes from the center of the disc, the center is brought into extensile stresses to such an extent that it overshadows the peripheral stresses. In other words, the radial stress overshadows the tangential stress. Is this not a learning? Third thing is correlation to field problems. When we correlate to field problems, we start learning from mother nature. When we have a better understanding of our product in mother nature, we start developing new tools and technologies, impregnating them into our product. Higher reliability of solutions to mitigate issues is a common requirement in the industry. How can that be done? Unless you simulate the gamut of the nonlinear environment in which the product is going to function, how can we be sure that the product has a higher amount of reliability? 
we all know that the number of components going into an assembly affects the reliability of the product. We also need to know that the combinatorial approach wherein physical stresses arising out of deformation, probably because of loading, which could be thermal, which could be mechanical, which could be a combination of these two, which could be as a result of reduced modulus. What do I mean by that reduced modulus? The material property changes over a period of time. Elastic modulus could change. The problem is when the pipe starts getting corroded, the sectional properties change. The sectional modulus changes. The flexional rigidity changes. So you may not have a problem of a vibration of a tube bundle when you installed it. After two or three years, when corrosion comes into a picture, the problem that may be reported to you, you might have given a corrosion allowance. Nevertheless, the problem that may get reported to you, either during warranty or after it, could be a problem of tube bundle vibrations which you never had earlier. So in other words, the bridge between our understanding and what really happens in, on the field is where we gain our knowledge from. Put that back into reuse in terms of procedures and finite elements. That's how the reliability model for your product becomes improved. Please understand, reliability is a probability. Definition of reliability has the word probability. Probability that the part will meet the intended function during the service life. While finite elements is a deterministic approach. When we take quality and reliability and we put a deterministic approach using finite element as the tool, that's exactly where the quality and the reliability of the product can be predicted upfront in advance, even before the component has been tooled up. So in terms of development of new technologies, it is important that the reliability and the quality are addressed upfront. It provides us with a scientific approach, a new mechanism by which new product development can be accelerated. So in other words, you have two different approaches. One is to take a linear code and do some nonlinear approximations and come up with results. The second one is to do a complete thoroughbred nonlinear finite element analysis and look at the exact state of analysis in that. So one could be one could be represented using an X-ray. The other could be taken analogously to a CT scan or an MRI scan. The choice of looking at the health of our product either ways is dependent on the choice of the approach that we have used using this finite element tools and technologies. Mind you, in all the problems that we face, for example, you take the blood vessel. The blood flows through the blood vessel. It is a non-Newtonian fluid, highly viscous, very, very slow velocities. The boundary layer is unpredictable. Now, as it flows through the blood vessel, the elastic modulus of the blood vessel will keep on changing. The concept of Poisson's ratio can be seen to be a mystery when it comes to these kinds of pipes. So when the tube expands, the stiffness changes, the pressure drops because now the fluid passage is different. So it is a problem involving the tube, which is your blood vessel, a Lagrangian problem. You have the fluid flow, which is an Eulerian problem. And you have the coupled field, which is involving the Lagrangian and the Eulerian approach. People may ask, why so much of complexity we need to understand? A scan doctor needs to understand the intrinsics of the process of scanning before he or she can provide you with the cause for the disease so that we can take remedial measures. Similarly, the scan for our product is your finite elements and you need to know the understand the physics behind it, the formulation behind it before we can start applying the tools and technologies with the do's and don'ts. So when we are taking these kinds of approaches, the Lagrangian and the Eulerian, I said, you take a mesh, the mesh deforms, the node moves, that is Lagrangian. You take a 
a cuboid. You allow the fluid to flow through it. The fluid enters the one side and comes out on the other side. The node does not move. The element does not deform. That is Eulerian approach. When you take these two together in a common coordinate system, where one is a Lagrangian element, which deforms, and the other one, which is an Eulerian element, which does not deform, which does not move, and put them in an arbitrary coordinate system, that is called as the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian. So, in other words, any nonlinear finite element analysis that we do can involve the physics of many of these. Kindly mute your microphone, please. It's disturbing the others. Thank you. So, when we are putting this together, the tools and technology should provide us with the capabilities to do these kinds of analysis. When a failure occurs, we cannot say I am having a linear code. The accuracy of the prediction comes into focus when the failure has to be mitigated and the solutions to the problems have to be given. A simple example, you have a pressure activator, you have a spring-loaded actuator, the spring is deforming. How will the spring fail? If it is a coil spring, the energy is stored in terms of torsional energy. The strain energy is torsional energy. If you look at a bending spring, if you look at a torsional spring, it is bending energy. If you look at a bending, if you look at an axial coil spring, it is torsional energy. Now, the axial stress itself does not create much of a problem in terms of fatigue life cycles. What creates a problem is the eccentricity of the axis of the coil in comparison to the line of action of the force. When these two come together, when there is an eccentricity, you have the bending component also coming into picture. Right? The bending produces consumption of fatigue life. How does the eccentricity get mapped? The eccentricity gets mapped as a result of assembly. The assembly as a result of tolerances. The tolerances and the contact. In both these areas, nonlinear finite element scores. So whenever we look at finite elements, we always look at finite elements on the utopic component with nominal dimensions. The moment you start bringing in the imperfections in the manufacturing process, the residual stresses that come about as a result of the manufacturing operations and or the assembly operations, the entire domain needs to be treated as nonlinear. So the different types of nonlinear finite element analysis could start with the large displacement problem. Displacement has both deflections and the physical moment coming together. Then you have the large strain problem. You take a look at your balloon. Though it is within the elastic limit, when you blow air through it or a bellow, it is large strain, right? Then material nonlinearity, rubber, composites, or you go up beyond the linear portion of the stress strain curve in a metal. Then you get high strain rate plasticity. When we do an extensile testing, a coupon component you take and you do a stress versus strain curve. We do it gradually, right? But in actual condition, does it really happen to be strains? The strain is not dependent on the strain rate. Probably not. For example, in metal forming, probably, in, for, for example, in the area of uh, projectile impact onto um, uh, armors. In all these cases, you have high strain plasticity coming into picture. Then you have coupled field problems that I have told about earlier and post failure simulations. In all these cases, you need to have the capability in terms of the process, in terms of the tools to develop technologies to mitigate the quality and the reliability issues upfront for the robustness of your design. So let us look at some of the real world simulation examples using Simulia and Abacus as documented, as published in the industry and we will share with you some of our experiences. The first example is going to be a torsion bar. 
This is an example of a filament wound composite that was developed for the Ford F-150 series pickup truck. If you look at the last year's performance of Ford, F-150 series pickup truck carries the maximum number of automobiles sold by Ford. And it's number one in the pickup truck area. They were trying to replace the torsion bar, which is 42 inches long, with an 8-inch torsion bar made out of composites. The wind-up angle is 70 degrees. This can be fitted into any part of the vehicle. The suspension can be anywhere. It need not be along the length of the truck. And then the filament wound composite, because of the thickness that is coming in, you cannot use shells. And the property varies through the thickness. The modulus changes. In all these cases, the treatment of the problem is completely anisotropic. Isotropic means the material direction is this. In all the directions, the material properties are the same. Anisotropic means it is completely different. So for people who have used finite elements, who have been exposed to the concepts of finite elements, we will know what are called as the elasticity, elasticity matrix, right? The material matrix. We typically give 21 constants for a fully populated anisotropic material model. A 36, a 6 by 6 matrix is what typically we come up with. In this particular case, you will have a 9 by 9 and a 3 by 3 and a 6 by uh, 1 and a 1 by 6 coming together to be a 9 by 9 matrix. 6 by 6, 3 by 3, 6 by 1 and a 1 by 6 coming together to be a 9 by 9 matrix, which later on gets condensed into a 6 by 6 matrix, which is 36 constants. Now, in typically in every problem that we solve, whether it is manual problem or a physical problem in finite elements, we don't solve for inequilibrium conditions. We solve only for equilibrium conditions. But there are situations where the material will not be in equilibrium. It could be in, in equilibrium. This is a classic example of that. In other words, the problem involves all the 36 constants to be provided, not the 21 alone. It is no longer a symmetric matrix. And we have to simulate the delamination. So when we predicted this, it took us a month to put this formulation together and we simulated this. We got the failure mode exactly in the same place where the physical failures were happening. I told them that I will not look at the failure. I will predict the failure and I will tell you exactly where the failures are and after how many cycles. That way my procedure can be validated. So there are, there are three different validations. One is the formulation of the material model. Second one is the material property itself. Third one is the procedure adopted. And last but not the least is the design validation itself. So in all these cases, we were in a position to understand and accept that the failure modes were going to occur at a particular life cycles and that we need to mitigate this risk. Imagine what would have happened if this product had been brought into the marketplace and there was a recall. The fix is expensive. You just cannot fit another suspension into it. So this is a classic example of a composite finite element analysis. The next one is in the area of brake rotors. We would have seen disc brake rotors being used in the marketplace, especially in the front discs. The rear is drum brakes. We introduced what is called as the aluminum disc brake because aluminum easily conducts heat. And the disc brake was developed in such a fashion that what you see is the coning of the disc brake. It becomes like a coned hat, leading to warranty issues with regard to effectiveness of braking. The brake pad wears out unevenly. So many things happen with steel disc brake rotors. So to alleviate this problem and to ensure that the transmissibility of forces are least, remember force equals mass times acceleration, the unsprung, the unsprung mass M for the same acceleration characteristics will, it will lead to lesser forces being transmitted upward beyond the suspension. So in these cases, when we took the 
composite material, aluminum material, which is much lighter, one third of elastic modulus of steel. And we came up with a brake rotor. Now remember, we had not worked with the aluminum earlier. We did not have experience of dealing with this new material, which had 20% silicon carbide in it, where you have to use a diamond cutter to cut it. Expensive, right? And then it's a metal matrix composite. It's used only by the aircraft industry. We need to come up with the material properties. In six months, we developed the procedure. In six months, we developed the brake rotor design, 16 different designs. Simulated all the 16 designs because the first six months we developed the procedure, right? We did the analysis to test correlations. We came up with all those things. And then we did the design of experiments, Taguchi's design of experiments, and refined it to four, two designs in terms of performance, in terms of cost. And then we finalized on one design which is available in the marketplace today. It was subsequently released in, to, in 1999. It's a patented design. The patent is provided there. Now, how did we come about doing it? We did not have any history of previous failure issues being reported. We did not have the knowledge base of how the performance is going to be down the line. We were dealing with a new material model. We did not know its longevity in terms of fatigue characteristics. We did not know the interaction between the pads and the material in friction. We did not know the dynamic friction or the static friction. Some people don't understand, don't accept the concept of dynamic friction. <laughs> okay. So the dynamic friction or the static friction, we had no clue. And we had to develop a pad specifically for this material. So the system as a whole had to be studied to come up with this particular design, which would have alleviated the warranty issues we were facing downstream. So in other words, to come up with a new product to mitigate the warranty issue, to overcome the brake squeal or to eliminate the brake squeal, the uh, deflection problems, the fading problems after 10 stops from 80 miles to zero in four and a half seconds, and then ramping back in 16 seconds back to 80 miles an hour, and then pressing the brakes again 10 times, the stopping distance cannot change. It's a safety problem, right? Now, when we brought all these things together, this design was born in under one year. The physical prototype was given in under one year. How was it possible? By considering everything to be a non-linear problem. This is where we were involved with the Simulia team to come up with a fluid structure element. The next one is random fiber composites in instrument panel to come up with the vibration problem and simulating it and making sure that lightweight composite structures withstand the requirements for vibration at the steering column as well as the crash worthiness subsequently down the line. Now elastomers, should I use a natural rubber, SBR or butyl rubber? What are the crack cycles to crack? How much it will take before the component really breaks up? Before the seal leaks. In all these cases, comparison of alternate materials can be done using a nonlinear finite element code such as Simulia Abacus. The durability simulation and the performance mapping. The applications, for example, in this case, the, to the cut and chip modeling of the tires. In fact, we had modeled the tire uh, tires quite a bit for some of our customers, specifically in the area of rim to tire contact. So looking at the radial fatigue test, so looking at the experimental stress analysis to the finite element uh, strains that are coming out of finite elements to correlate these two, to look at the results in the wheel, as well as to look at what is the energy that is being absorbed in the event of an impact with regard to the tire, inflated tire itself. We have done all these kinds of simulation using uh, this tool. It is famous for that. It's used by the industry quite a bit. Next one is 
We typically live, the finite element analysts live in the utopic world where we look at nominal dimensions. But nothing is nominal in this world. You have tolerances, you have imperfections. The case in point is a connecting rod. To look at the impact of the bearing fit deformation, the seal, uh, the, uh, the lubrication of the bearing issues, the life cycle of this particular unit coming as a result of wear and tear. Wear and tear comes from contact. Contact comes from uh, the nonlinear simulation involving the pressure um, variation across the unit where the interference fit comes into picture. The tightening torque, the assembly process comes into picture. The operation, the machining deformation comes into picture. And then the spring back comes into picture post manufacturing process. And subsequently looking at the actual loading coming in. Typically in a regular finite element, we look at only the load application during the service life. We really don't look at what goes into the inherent state of stress in the component, either as a result of the tolerances what we give, or as a result of the tightening torque, or the variation of it, or the variation of the fits in as produced the components. Where does it lie in the bell curve? How many components are within the uh, six sigma levels or the three sigma levels? In all these cases, you can do what are called as perturbation studies. We looked at machining deformation. In one particular case, a customer had a requirement where the component was, the flatness tolerance on the component could not be achieved. It's a crankcase for a two-wheeler. The oil was leaking. This was in 2001. The tolerance they had provided was 50, 60 microns. They were trying to reduce it to five microns. But the tooling department and the production department said it is impossible for them to achieve five microns because the process capability was not there. How do you solve this? The simulation with regard to cutter coming in, taking the material out, the load keeps on changing. The line of action of the load keeps on changing. The clamping comes up. The stiffness of the component during clamping affects the flatness, right? In all these cases, the pre-simulation in terms of its manufacturing process brings about the light, throws the light on the culprit, and we are able to mitigate or solve the problem. So correlating it to physical testing, 99% correlation to uh, anal analysis to test correlations are no brainer with these kinds of tools and technologies as long as the analyst knows exactly what he is looking at and how he is solving it. And then we have the elastomers, which are typically used in the anti vibration mounts. We developed 13 mounts for a company which has seven locations worldwide. We developed the mounts. Here again, the elastomer is non linear. What should be the property of the elastomer for the deterministic service life that we are looking at? We have done this example quite a bit for a lot of different customers in reducing the vibration so that the overall system, vib system life can be improved. What I'm showing is the thesis of a, of a student for Professor Dr. Ali Fatimi from my alma mater, University of Toledo, where I studied. And uh, this is a classic example of a simulation versus um, amount a cycle time simulation and looking at the results versus the analysis. Bridging the gap between the analysis and test helps to assure you that you have mastered the technology, you have understood the physical phenomena in addition to looking at the repeatability and the reproducibility in the testing, which is a big factor when it comes to reliability of any product. Just because we have tested a component in the lab and it has passed, it does not mean that it is going to pass the service life. There's a caveat here. And what is the caveat? It is an essential requirement, but not sufficient to assure durability and reliability during the service life of the product. So here, the stiffness changes as the load is applied. And depending on the frequency in which you are applying the hysteresis, the life cycle changes quite a bit. 
these kinds of simulations can be simulated a priori because the testing of these requires sophisticated testing equipment, which is probably beyond the reach of common industries in India today. We worked with one customer who had a 80 lakh turnover. Turnover was 80 lakhs. We developed an elastomeric mount for windmills specifically for this customer, tested it out. In the first testing itself, it got a TU rating from Europe. And today that customer has more than five times the turnover only from that product. This customer is from India in Chennai. Today, fortunately, these tools and technologies are available for lease. In other words, you don't need to own the software. You can lease it whenever you want. During the product life cycle, product validation phase in your new product development. So you can use the software, you can test it out, you can use their computers on the cloud. No investment is required other than leasing for that requirement. And you can go to 16 core multi core processing without investing in any of those. Get your results out, measure yourself of the reliability and proceed further. Today, it is affordable primarily because of availability of these options today. This is another example of a classic case where contacts can wreak havoc, where temperature effects, arcing effects, material attrition as a result of contacts because of the discharge which takes place, the correlation to measured data, higher reliability is required. Otherwise, field recall is a painful process. There are quite a few areas where field recall is a painful process. One is impl implements in human beings. Imagine Johnson & Johnson went through a $4 billion recall on their implants. What do I mean by recall there? Patients have been put, implants have been impregnated into the patients. Now, those, those patients have to be called back. The implants have to be removed and the new ones have to be fitted in. Our compensation has to be provided. Four billion dollars, they gave a compensation. So a lot of different areas in which new product validation can be brought about. And let us say this is a mass production contactor. Imagine if there's going to be a problem, especially with DC currents, with their higher amperage is coming into picture. In the automotive arena, in a lot of different areas. Here, these contact simulations can be done and material removal in terms of its changes in its elastic modulus or sectional modulus can be brought about, can be seen with a greater level of accuracy that would be possible with these kinds of nonlinear finite element codes. In summary, when we look at the benefits, the improved reliability is a no brainer, it's forgiven. Enhanced quality is assured. Avoiding product recall, as I told you earlier. Greater confidence in design engineering. Technology development, new product technology. Every time we release a product into the marketplace, we need to ask ourselves this question. How unique is our product in terms of technology introduced in it? What is so special about our product? What is so unique about our product? What is the IPR that is there in the product? Can you put your photograph, phone, please? Thank you. So we, we need to ask ourselves this question. What is the uniqueness of the product or technology that we have developed? that is going to make our product and technology self-sustaining and long-lasting and capturing larger market with the emphasis on Atmanirbhar Bharat. This is more important today than ever before. Sustained product life cycle is important, right? So in other words, during the service life cycle, these kinds of tools and technologies help us. And the, the benefit is the robust design practices that need, that need to be incorporated for higher customer satisfaction. Let us remember, a problem reported at the design stage costs, let us say, 10 rupees. It becomes an order of magnitude when it is tooled up. 
when further an order of magnitude when it is reported by the customer. The choice is ours whether we can do it upfront or subsequently down the line. The IPR ownership for higher market capitalization is required. The days are beckoning us when we need to develop products and technologies in this country where it will say proudly licensed by companies in India, proudly level licensed by other countries based on technologies developed by countries, companies in India. Thank you very much for providing that. I specifically put one uh, slide on the fatigue characteristic for life cycles uh, where the correlation graph was presented. Where are these mixed elements? You see the domain, see at the end of the day, finite element is a numerical solution, numerical procedure to solve a governing differential equation. The numerical procedure can be linear, can be non-linear, can be coupled field, can be a single field, can be any combination. So at the end of the day, the formulation is dependent on the nature of problem we are trying to solve. For example, for tooth, for removing the tooth from the gums, this simulation can be used. For cranial impact, it can be used. For helmets, it can be used. How accurate can we get the results? The accuracy is dependent on your understanding of the physical phenomena. It has nothing to do with the finite elements per se. The technology itself has its own limitation in terms of the hierarchical finite elements in terms of the accuracy of stresses. But that is minuscule as compared to the accuracy we are talking about in terms of knowing in advance what kind of failure modes that we are going to face. So the accuracy is only as dependent on, dependent upon you for the choice of elements, for the type of procedures, for the time you are willing to solve and the time you have. Very great exotic finite elements can be done. Very simplified analysis can be done. You start with the simple and you end up with the most exotic so that you have understood how your product and technology functions. The choice is yours. The software enables you to do that. If you have any further questions, you can post it to us on info at egs.co.in. We thank you for the time well spent this afternoon. The, um, we hope the situation, the um, uh, simulation webinar was uh, rewarding to you in terms of uh, gains that you would have got for the different kinds of simulations that you can do for your products and technologies. And we shall be glad to address the same. In the event you are looking at new product development or you are looking at solving your uh, field failure problems or warranty issues or you are trying to reduce the cost of your product without attracting warranty or other issues. Thank you very much for your time and well spent. We are having this webinar every month. So stay tuned for more exciting webinar technology series coming downstream. Have a wonderful week and a weekend ahead. Stay safe. Thank you and healthy.